Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Dawson, and I'm a founding member of the cardiovascular group here at Guelph. And today, it's my honor to introduce our next uh, distinguished scientist, Dr. Zam Kassiri. Uh, Dr. Kassiri comes to us from the University of Al Alberta in Edmonton, uh, where she's an associate professor in the Department of Physiology and is part of the uh, Cardiovascular Research Center in the Mazankowski Alberta Heart uh, Institute. She did all of her undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral training in Toronto, uh, doing her graduate work with Peter Bax and her postdoc with Rema Koka, before setting up her own lab in 2007, uh, where she studies the role of extracellular matrix in heart and vasculature diseases. Uh, she's an outstanding researcher. We're really delighted to have her here today. She's published, you know, 90 papers and in four and four book chapters in high impact journals. She's been supported by the Heart and Stroke Foundation for her entire career, including uh, doctoral, postdoctoral fellowships, uh, new investigator award. Most recently, she was named an Alberta Heart and Stroke Foundation Mavericks researcher. Uh, in addition, she also won the Canadian Cardiovascular Society's Young Investigator Award and is an Alberta Innovates Health Solutions Scholar. And I was just chatting with her today, and a couple of weeks ago, uh, she became a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. So we're very fortunate to have uh, her with us today. She's also a board member of the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, is part of the CIHR College of Reviewers, and has sat on the Canadian Heart and Stroke Association and American Heart Association grant panels. So it's my great privilege to present Dr. Kassiri with this plaque, um, celebrating her talk today. There you are. Great. And please join me in welcoming her to Guelph. Oh. Forward. Oh, something is the keyboard, all right. Okay. I think so. Yep. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you very much to the organizers and to Dr. Martino for inviting me to be here in this uh, wonderful occasion, the first cardiovascular research day. That's always exciting. Um, and uh, it's my first visit to Guelph, I should say. I'm quite impressed. It's a very nice institute you have, and I'm sure the Cardiovascular Research Center will become one of the prominent centers in the, in the country, if not worldwide, and, uh, in a few short years. So uh, today I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I'll focus on one of the researches that, uh, one of the projects that we are doing in the lab. But before I start, last night you were joking that um, my research is on extracellular matrix, and. Lori said matrix is only about the blue pill and the red pill, so I thought I'd put this one here. But in reality, uh, the extracellular matrix is a structural uh, organization, is a structural network that provides support for all different kinds of tissues in the body. Heart is no exception. And um, of course, during research, you have different methods of visualizing the, uh, of the extracellular matrix. You can use fluorescent microscopy or electron microscopy to visualize the matrix. And this was, this has been a technique to document any changes in the matrix for, the, for many years. And in fact, you can decellularize the heart and what you'll end up with is the matrix of the heart. And as you can see, it does in fact account for a sizable content of the heart itself. So this is my, uh, my my spin on validating the research in cardiovascular extracellular matrix. Over the past few years, we have done a lot of work on the proteins that regulate the uh, extracellular matrix on MMPs and TIMPs, and we have found very exciting and unexpected results in, the, in terms of the function of TIMPs in heart disease and different uh, types of heart diseases. I will not go into that, and um, uh, I'll, I, I'll try to show you a little more bit of recent work that we've done in, in the lab. So what we've learned about the extracellular matrix in the past decade or so is that in addition to providing a structural support for the heart, it also houses a number of proteins like proteoglycans that are by nature sticky molecules in the extracellular matrix and they hold on to growth factors and um, um, cytokines in the matrix 
Um, by doing so, now we have the growth factors and cytokines present in the tissue waiting for a cue in order to be released and to bind to their receptors to trigger a response. So if you have disruptions in the extracellular matrix, not only you are destabilizing the organ structurally, but you'll also be messing up, for the lack of a better word, um, the signaling pathways and the signaling uh, events that happen in the heart or any other tissue. Now, we are all familiar, I hope you are all familiar with the MMPs and the membrane type MMPs. These are proteases that are present mostly in the soluble form in extracellular space. But recently we have stumbled upon a class or a family of proteases that are very similar to MMPs, except that they also have a disintegrant domain and they are membrane bound. And they are known as a disintegrant and metalloproteinase or atoms. Now, uh, proteases are a large, a very huge family of molecules. There are more than 550 members discovered, and they fall in different groups, in different classes of cysteine proteases, metalloproteases, serine, threonine, and aspartame uh, proteases. Uh, atoms, as well as MMPs, fall in the metallopropyl family and uh, subfamily. So, in terms of uh, relevance, it becomes very relevant to look at the role of atoms in the heart, which has been um, quite overlooked. So this, these are the kind of projects that we do in the lab, just to kind of uh, put things in perspective. About half of my lab uh, looks at the heart disease and the, diff and the role of these mole regulatory molecules in heart disease. We've gotten into hypertension and vascular uh, disorders by using smooth muscle cell and endothelial cell specific knockout mice. Uh, we have become very interested in aortic aneurysm. We've had very interesting findings in terms of the ma matrix regulation and uh, I took upon the, the task of generating triple transgenic knockouts in order to examine the role of atherosclerosis and aneurysm, and I will be very delighted when these mice are actually finally generated. So a brief uh, background on the ADAM-17. ADAM-17 is also known or was initially named TNF-alpha converting enzyme because this is how it was discovered as the enzyme that um, cleaves or proteolic proteolytically releases the membrane-bound TNF and allows it to go on and bind to its receptor. Now, over the years, many, many substrates have been identified for ADAM-17. Um, a lot of the adhesion molecules, cytokines, growth factors, uh, you name it, it's been reported. Mind you, most of these studies were done in cancer cells, they were done in culture, they were done in inflammatory settings. In terms of the heart and what is known about the role of ADAM-17 in the heart, we know that ADAM-17 is expressed at very high levels in the heart. There was a study back in 2006, this is when uh, Paul Fedak was a postdoc in Toronto. He did the study where he looked at the human hearts from uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and control hearts, and he found that ADAM-15 and ADAM-17 were elevated in the diseased hearts. And that's pretty much the extent that uh, the, the literature has gone to this point. And there was a paper later, I think it was in 2010, where they showed ADAM-17 goes through a transient increase after myocardial infarction, and then its level drops. Other than that, it's been um, ADAM-17 and TNF-alpha in inflammation and inflammatory diseases. And you look at reviews like ADAM-17 does it all basically implying that there are numerous um, substrates for ADAM-17. So it becomes very difficult to predict the function of ADAM-17 in heart disease. Does it really contribute to progression of disease or is it a bystander that kind of is there when things happen? So in order to do that, we wanted to use a genetic model of ADAM-17 deficiency. ADAM-17 deficiency, whole body deficiency, is embryonically or perinatally lethal. Mice are born, but they die within a couple of days. So we wanted to generate a cell-specific uh, transgenic model that would allow the knockdown of this gene after birth. Uh, so we crossed the flox flox, ADAM-17 flox flox mice with alpha MHC Cree mice, and we generated the um, uh, cardiomyocyte specific knockout mice. We isolated the cardiomyocytes and the non-cardiomyocytes, and you can see that ADAM-17 level is significantly decreased in the cardiomyocytes, but not in the non-cardiomyocytes. And with that, we also um, uh, found that the total activity uh, levels of, of ADAM-17 is decreased. Um, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with this procedure. Um, I know Tammy does this routinely in her lab, uh, myocardial infarction in mice, LED ligation, echo analysis, followed by molecular analysis of different um, infarct, peri-infarct, and non-infarct. And uh, the reason that we chose the myocardial infarction model is because ADAM17, through its uh, function of TNF-alpha, has been linked to cell death and to, uh, to inflammation. So we thought this would be a good model. And of course, our prediction was that in the absence of ADAM17, the mice are going to survive MI a lot better with uh, less defect. Now, lo and behold, we were wrong. Mind you, it wasn't the first time that our hypothesis was incorrect. Um, following myocardial infarction, we found that the Cre mice had showed a much lower rate of survival and a much higher rate of LV rupture following um, after up to four weeks of myocardial infarction. And these are representative um, heart cross sections. When we looked at the function of the heart, we did this in three different ways. We measured ejection fraction. You can see there's significant decrease after MI in the Cre mice. Uh, we looked at fractional area um, change. This was also decreased, and we looked at wall motion score index, uh, which means the higher the value, the less the wall motion. So essentially, the function in these mice were worse, uh, was worse, and LV and diastolic volume showed that the dilation was almost, the, or LV chamber size was almost doubled in these mice. So they were not doing so well, right? Knocking down ADAM17 in the cardiomyocyte didn't quite help. Now, one of the post-MI cellular events that really contributes to the remodeling of the heart is angiogenesis. So our first question was, since ADAM17 has been shown to, to promote angiogenesis um, in, um, in retina, we, we looked into seeing how angiogenesis is altered in these cells. Uh, we used an in vivo lectin injection model where the, uh, in anesthetized mice, you inject them with fluorescent tagged lectin. You allow it to get through the entire perfusion, perfusion system so all your microvasculature is stained. Compared to the sham hearts here, we have the controlled flocks mice up there and the Cree mice down here. Um, the infarct area in these mice, in the Cree mice, show a lower density, as you can see in the average data here. The infarct area shows a much lower vascular density compared to the parallel control MI. Uh, we confirmed that by staining for CD31, which is an endothelial uh, marker, endothelial cell marker, and stains your uh, vasculature. Uh, again, we saw that the density of the vasculature was significantly lower in these uh, Cre mice, in ADAM17 Cre mice. So this was our initial hypothesis. And we thought it was quite brilliant that ADAM17 on the cardiomyocyte cleaves the vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, that is bound to the extracellular matrix, allows it to travel to the endothelial cells, which are in the neighboring area, activating the uh, VEGF receptor to promoting angiogenesis. So the obvious thing was to measure the soluble VEGF in these mice. Uh, and we did that in the plasma, we did it in the heart, we didn't see a difference, we thought, okay, maybe it's getting diluted in the whole body. We cultured adult cardiomyocytes, and in order to provide them with the matrix, so we co-cultured them with cardiofibroblasts so that they have, there is a place for the VEGF to be um, lingering onto. And we triggered these cells, treated these cells with ischemia to kind of simulate the myocardial infarction. And what we saw was that ischemia definitely increased the VEGF release into the culture media, but there was no difference between the Cre group, uh, ADAM17 Cre, and the control group. So long story short, we were wrong. So we went back to the drawing board. This is a textbook picture for angiogenesis. We have VEGF binding to VEGF receptors, activating the signaling pathways leading to angiogenesis. So we thought, okay, if VEGF, if the supply of the ligand is not altered between the groups, let's look to see what happens to the receptor. And of course, the VEGF receptor, when it's activated, it becomes phosphorylated. So we measured the, uh, or we stained for phosphorylated VEGF receptor. And again, you have the FLOX group on the top and the CRE group on the, at the bottom. And we saw that the activation or the level of the activated VEGF receptor 2 was markedly reduced, as you can see from the average data here. And when we looked at the total level of receptor 2, it was also decreased in these Cre mice compared to the um, Phlox mice. And of course, at the expression level, it was also decreased. So this told us that there is a regulation happening at the transcription level. 
And uh, sure enough, atom uh, 17 through TNF alpha, NF kappa B, which is, which is a very well known transcription factor, um, it mediates this pathway since the, um, in plasma and in the myocardium, the levels of soluble TNF alpha was significantly reduced in the atom 17 cremice. And we performed the EMSA to look at the binding of NF kappa B to the DNA. And we saw that this level was also decreased in the cremice compared to the flox mice. So the mechanism that we came up with in this, or we, we found out to be through which ADAM17 functions, is that in the cardio, on the cardiomyocytes, ADAM17 cleaves the membrane-bound TNF-alpha, releasing it to interact with the VEGF receptors on the endothelial cells, leading to transcriptional regulation of VEGF receptor 2, increasing its level in the endothelial cells in order to promote angiogenesis. Now, mind you, in the retina, ADAM17 has, has been shown to decrease angiogenesis by cleaving VEGF receptor 2 um, here, by cleaving the receptor 2. So that's the message that I'm going to come back to later at the end of the talk, that the function of ADAM17 is very much dependent on the cell type and on the disease and the conditions that you're, you are working with. So naturally, the next question in our mind was, is this the function of ADAM17 in all different types of heart diseases, or is it limited to the myocardial infarction? So we looked at a model of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the second most common cause of heart disease in human beings. Again, we use the common model of aortic uh, constriction, or the TAC model. Uh, I don't need to go through this. I know um, there are a lot of labs here, um, including Dr. Martino's lab also does this uh, method where you basically um, band or constrict the uh, aorta. You allow the my, my mouse to deal with the elevated afterload. They develop a compensatory hypertrophy. If it's prolonged, it becomes dilated uh, cardiomyopathy. And these are human hearts to show the comparison. And there is another very commonly used, the agonist-induced hypertrophy, where you put angiotensin II in an osmotic pump and you allow the mouse to for two to four weeks and they develop myocardial hypertrophy. So in this model, what we observed was that compared to the flux groups, after two weeks and five weeks of TAC, these ADAM17 deficient mice had a much larger, they had much larger hearts. So they were, there was more hypertrophy and there was more, more dilation. For those of you who've worked with alpha MHC cream mice, you know that they could have some background effects causing hypertrophy on their own. So we ran a parallel um, alpha MHC cream mice and by far five weeks of TAC, we saw a very similar hypertrophy to the uh, controlled flux flux group. So we did the check mark that, we, um, that our control worked out. So here we're seeing that in the ADAM17 deficient mice, there is a significantly higher level of uh, myocardial hypertrophy. When we looked at the fibrosis, these are trichrome, these are PSR stain images. The bottom rows are the Cree groups. You can see that by the five weeks of uh, TAC, there is more interstitial, primarily a higher interstitial fibrosis in these mice. So they're clearly sicker, as also evident by um, uh, cardiac function. Um, at five weeks in controlled mice, obviously you expect some dilation and dysfunction, but this was a lot worse in the, um, in the CRE mice. And we also measured the LA size, normalized to the body weight, and left the atrial size as a measure of uh, diastolic dysfunction. And we also found that these CRE mice, they showed worsening of um, diastolic dysfunction and um, heart disease in general. Now, pressure overload or pressure or mechanical stress is a very interesting model in that the way this works is that when the heart is working against an elevated pressure, it tries to work harder, it tries to press harder, so the left ventricular wall is experiencing a mechanical stress. And that mechanical stress is transmitted through the extracellular matrix to the integrin dimers, which are basically the receptors on the cardiomyocytes that connect the extracellular matrix to the cells. It is very well known through the work of uh, Rob Ross that um, um, integrin levels are elevated in response to pressure overload, and that triggers the cardio, uh, the hypertrophy response. So, of course, that was the that was the next place that we looked at. In the flux group, we saw that these are integrin staining. Uh, in response to TAC, we saw a, an expected elevation in the integrin levels, 
But in the Cree mice, we saw that after TAC, this increase was much higher. It was much more significant. We did the whole quantification. We measured the uh, Western blots as well. And we saw that compared to the uh, control groups that show an, an increase, this increase was much larger in the uh, Cree groups. And the downstream pathway that is, has been linked to hypertrophy is the FAC activation and phosphofac. Again, it was elevated in the FLOX group, but much more in the um, ADAM17 FLOX, uh, ADAM17 Cree mice. So clearly, this pathway is amplified in the mice lacking ADAM17 in their cardiomyocytes. So our hypothesis was that ADAM17 must be cleaving integrin so that, or integrin beta 1, which is the key integrin in this process, so that if you don't have enough ADAM17 around, your um, integrins get out of control, you end up with a large, a high level of integrin and an amplified hypertrophic pathway activation. So we did this um, in situ uh, kind of biochemical assay where we had uh, an increasing level of uh, ADAM17 to a um, fixed amount of integrin alpha-5 beta-1, which is one of the dimers present in the cardiomyocytes. And uh, what we found was that in a concentration-dependent way, dependent manner, we saw a higher and higher level of degradation products of integrin in these mice. So it's, um, I should say, this is the first report of all the substrates that have been reported for ADAM17. Uh, none have been linked to integrin, and this was the first evidence showing that integrin beta-1 can be a substrate for um, ADAM17. And, um, and I showed you that there was, there's also another commonly used hypertrophy model, and that's the ANG2-induced hypertrophy model. So we naturally asked the question that, again, it, does this apply to all myocardial hypertrophy uh, uh, models and diseases? And surprisingly, when we looked at the um, ANG2-induced hypertrophy, we didn't see any difference between the FLOX and the FLOX Cree mice. And that became obvious when we looked at the integrin levels, because integrin levels are not upregulated in response to agonist-induced hypertrophy. And that seems to be, the ANG2 function seems to be primarily through the release of or overexpression of HPEGF, which is a very well-known hypertrophic growth factor, which was altered very similarly in the FLOX and the FLOX Cree group. So clearly there are different pathways involved in the hypertrophy induced by mechanical stress versus angiotensin II. And therefore this pathway, this model was not affected by um, ADAM17. Now, we thought we had nailed this one and we had a very strong evidence of ADAM17 cleaving um, integrin and therefore regulating the hypertrophy pathway. Reviewer three didn't think so. So it wanted to, he wanted us to uh, demonstrate in an isolated and a controlled setting that ADAM17 is in fact responsible for the hypertrophic response. So we had to go to the rat ventricular myocytes because uh, mouse ventricular neonatal myocytes have been shown to not respond to hypertrophic factors or not very reliably and consistently. So we moved to the rat model and we used the siRNA uh, technique in order to downregulate the ADAM17 levels. And here you can see that, um, if I can read this, yeah. So this is the control. This is, we use two different um, siRNA in order to make sure that there is no off-target um, effects. And we saw that after, stre after stretching these myocytes, there was an increase in um, ADAM17 levels, and this um, increase was not observed in the, um, in the siRNA group. And of course, this was, I was just very happy that we had the means to be doing this experiment because this was not an experiment where you could culture cells and add an agonist and measure the hypertrophy. Uh, we used the flex cell system in order to induce cyclic stretching to these car cardiomyocytes in order to simulate the uh, pressure overload or mechanical stress in these mice. And as you can see, um, in the siRNA groups, this stretch-induced hypertrophy or enlargement of the cells was amplified, was larger than the um, FLOX group, than the control group, the control ADAM17 group. We measured the cell surface area and we also measured the um, hypertrophy or disease markers. So this is the, um, essentially this is the model that we came up with in terms of mechanical stress. In a healthy myocardium, you have 
integrins connecting the cardiomyocytes to the matrix. You have ADAM17 present in the heart. Uh, you have um, um, ligands and um, other factors like HBEGF present in the myocardium. After pressure overload, you get increased density of the extracellular matrix, which is also uh, leads to fibrosis eventually. ADAM17 cleaves the integrin beta-1. Now, you have already an increased level of um, integrin complexes in these pressure overloaded hearts. Uh, ADAM17 clips off some of these, therefore moderates the hypertrophy response. Now, in an ANG2 model of hypertrophy, you have ADAM17 here, you have the growth factors here, sorry, this is in the absence of um, ADAM17, that in the absence of 17, you subject the heart to the pressure overload, your integrin levels go up, but your ADAM17 levels don't go as high. It's still present because it's a down, it's a knockdown model, it's not completely deleted, it's a, it's a knockdown model, so it's still present, but not to the full level in order to regulate the um, uh, integrin uh, levels, and therefore you end up with a much higher level of hypertrophy. Now, in agonist-induced hypertrophy, you have the same system, except that your integrins are not elevated in response to the agonist. What you have is that your uh, HBEGF is cleaved, and that, is, um, that transactivates the EG EGFR receptors. And that activates a different growth factors, and this becomes a whole different story that what cleaves the HBEGF MMP7 and ADAM12 have been shown to cleave the HBEGF, so ADAM17 does not seem to play a role in this process. And because of that, a knocking down ADAM17 does not make any difference in this model. So the overall conclusion that I would like to make, and I think this is gonna, this is gonna um, apply to pr probably all the projects that you guys as graduate students will take on as uh, graduate or postdoctoral fellows, is that when you're dealing with the molecule, don't take it for granted if it does a certain thing in a, mo in a certain model or a certain cell type that it's gonna do the same thing universally, all right? So it, in terms of ADAM17, for example, its function is very much dependent on cell type, on the type of disease, on the type of heart disease, and also the triggering or the, the stimulation factor or what the injury is. And we have found that we've, uh, we are very now very much interested in atoms in, in heart disease, and uh, we found this to be the case for other atoms as well. Um, again, a story for, for another day, but hopefully when we have a little more um, data, I'll be uh, um, happy to share that with you. Now, these are the individuals who've uh, worked, who've actually done the work, and most of this work was done by my former uh, fellow, Dong Fan, who is now a, an assistant professor in uh, University of Guangzhou. And uh, this is my technician and the students. And of course, uh, I wouldn't be able to present any of this data if it wasn't for their hard work. Uh, collaborators, we've got collaborators everywhere. And uh, in terms of this, um, this work, the collaborators were Gavin noted. And um, he's my uh, favorite collaborator and my husband, disclaimer. Um, and John Subert is the collaborator who uh, brought the, uh, who helped us with the neonatal cultures. Uh, funding over the past years, um, it's been helped the grant going and CIHR you can see is a little smaller these days and hopefully it won't be a permanent thing. And uh, this is um, Edmonton, but not covered in snow. Okay, thanks again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. in terms of the signaling pathways. Yeah, yeah. We, we got as far as the NF kappa B. We didn't, we didn't get into the mTOR because, um, yeah, we didn't get into, into analyzing the hypertrophy pathways any further than that. For sure, yep.
Well, if not, though, I want to please join me in thanking Dr. Siri for a wonderful talk.